all know why certain dates are important in our country's history, like the 4th of July or the 7th of December. But April 19th, with the fighting at Concord's North Bridge, is just as important in our history, perhaps more so. Even if you are familiar with the events of that day, feel that you know the whole story, you may be surprised. Let's venture back to that day and see how it really turned out. All liberty contains a universal secret. The secret is the education of people. At the core of all oppression, you discover the preservation of ignorance. In a little over two centuries, our nation's origin stories have been pulled apart and twisted by well-meaning people. So much so that the narratives of heroism, successes, and failures of how our nation began would not be recognized today by the very people who performed those deeds. Let's consider a well-known phrase that demonstrates how our nation's narrative has been twisted, which is, no taxation without representation. Nearly everyone across the world would confidently say that this phrase about taxation would be the reason for our rebellion. In our Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776, it listed 27 grievances for the rebellion being fought. Of those 27 causes, the taxation representation issue was listed as the 17th item, beaten out by other reasons such as England's interference with the naturalization of aliens. 1763 was a year of monumental events whose effects are still felt even today. The year began with the French surrendering most of its North American territory to England at the end of the Seven Years' War. With this surrender, the North American continent was seen as a wilderness with unlimited potential and land for settlement that stretched as far as the eye could imagine. At that very moment in time, the future of both the English North American colonies and the British Empire shone like a brightly rising sun. But just eight months later, a movement started that came to eclipse everything that came before it. That development was when the English law-abiding citizens who inhabited North America were motivated towards the path of rebellion. A rebellion that would turn these same law-abiding English citizens into rebellious icons. Rebels who stood up and struggled to form a new nation state, however imperfect, but which completely reinvented how a government and its people related and began to grow together. Another example of this transformation into rebellion was that the uprising against England did not start on the 4th of July, 1776, nor did it begin at the Old North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts, where the shot that was heard round the world occurred. The conversion to becoming revolutionaries began quite simply enough when a royal proclamation that was issued in October 1763 with restrictions that altered every English North American colony's charter. This one event began a steady drumbeat to rebellion with eight well-known mileposts that marked our path to our break with England. The milestones are summarized as follows. One, the first direct tax by England called the Stamp Act in 1765. Milestone two, in response to colonial resistance and boycotts of British commerce, the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766. Three, the Four Revenue Tax Acts and the law to dismiss the New York legislature, known collectively as the Townshend Acts, in 1767. The fourth milestone, the 1768 Boston Non-Importation Agreement that began an effective boycott of commerce with England. Five, the Boston Massacre on the 5th of March, 1770, that killed five colonists. Six, in 1772, the publishing of the Boston Pamphlet, outlining the colonists' rights and how their rights were violated by England. 
1867, the colonies began organizing shadow governments called Committees of Correspondence in November of 1772. And finally, the eighth milestone was the Boston Tea Party on the 16th of December, 1773. General Thomas Gage had been the commanding general of English North America from 1763 to 1773, and Gage was generally well respected on both sides of the Atlantic. He left the colonies in 1773 and returned to England. While being considered for the post of Royal Governor of Massachusetts and Commander-in-Chief, he consulted with both the English Privy Council and King George in early 1774. In April, Gage's appointments became official, and he sailed to Boston and arrived in May 1774. His primary focus was to enforce Parliament's actions. In an attempt to restore order and in response to the Boston Tea Party, Parliament had drawn up five laws collectively known as the Repressive, Coercive, or Intolerable Acts. These laws imposed by England are summarized as closing the port of Boston to all commerce, abolishing all locally elected government control in Massachusetts, forcing residents in all of the colonies to house and feed troops for free, mandating the state religion in Quebec to be Catholicism, and removing any local control of the criminal courts throughout the colonies turning it over to the royal governors. Witnessed by George Mason, one of our founding fathers summarized his observation of the colonists' conversion to becoming rebels by saying, we claim nothing but the liberties and privileges of English men. The Massachusetts Government Act, enacted by Parliament that year, directed Thomas Gage to replace and appoint all court officials across the Massachusetts colony. Due to the level of unrest and resistance in the countryside outside of Boston, the governor came to realize that he did not have enough troops to enforce his decreed court appointments. The inability for the governor to enforce the directives with troops became readily apparent on the 16th and the 30th of August, when colonists forced the closure of the western Massachusetts courts in Great Barrington and Springfield. Receiving intelligence reports concerning the plans to oppose the opening of the courts in Worcester, Gage canceled the dispatch of the British regulars that he had promised in support of the appointed officials. On the 6th of September, the county militia assembled on the main street outside of the courthouse in Worcester and every Crown appointed official was forced to resign. Those officials left with their hats in their hands and stood in front of each company of militia who numbered over 4,600 and publicly renounced their appointed positions. The direct result of forcing the court officials of Worcester to resign was that all of the Crown appointed officials outside of Boston had resigned or were made to resign by the end of October. Then one of the most important actions in our country's narrative took place at a town meeting in Worcester, Massachusetts on the 4th of October, 1774. That act was when the town council issued the first declaration of independence from England on the North American continent. The declaration was found in the fifth paragraph of the instructions to Timothy Bigelow, a blacksmith, who was selected as a delegate to the Provincial Congress. The declaration reads, you are to consider the people of this province as absolved on their part from the obligation therein contained and to all intents and purposes reduced to a state of nature, and you are to exert yourself in devising ways and means to raise from the dissolution of the old constitution as from the ashes of the phoenix, a new form. At the very moment the town council issued their instructions to Mr. Bigelow, these Englishmen were no longer disgruntled farmers and merchants voicing dissatisfaction. These citizens of England had become rebels. 
Coupled with this declaration and the outlawed illegal meetings of the provincial and continental congresses, Parliament's reactions were predictably harsh. These actions caused the English Parliament to declare on the 5th of February 1775 that the colony of Massachusetts was in a state of open rebellion and ordered their military governor in Boston, General Thomas Gage, to begin the seizure of stockpiled supplies and arrest ringleaders of the rebellion, particularly John Hancock and Sam Adams. On the 15th of April, 1775, the ship carrying those orders landed in Boston Harbor. Upon receiving his orders, Gage started his planning for a search and destroy expedition to Concord. On the 18th of April, Gage issued the orders to send a brigade of mixed infantry to carry out those directives. Thomas Gage was unaware that his attempted efforts to seriously disable the growing rebellion would lead to a history-altering confrontation. This unplanned clash would occur at a most unlikely spot. That spot was a bridge on the Concord River, located a half mile north of the town of Concord, a quite modest structure in constant need of repair, known as the Old North Bridge. We're here at the site of the Old North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts. This is the 12th bridge built at this location. The bridge that was here on the 19th of April, 1775, was actually built in 1760 and was the eighth bridge. This whole area floods every spring, and as a result, a raised roadway was needed to maintain access. The flooding that occurred damaged the bridge frequently and was the reason the bridge was often replaced. The expense to constantly rebuild the bridge was considered excessive and in 1793 it was deemed to be no longer useful. A new site was found several hundred yards downriver and the Old North Bridge was removed. There was no bridge at this site for 81 years until the construction of the 10th bridge for the centennial celebration of the American Revolution in 1875. The new bridge was similar, but had pavilions and flagpoles installed as well. Severe flooding from Hurricane Diane in 1955 destroyed the 11th bridge. It was then replaced in 1956 by the 140 foot span we now see. In order to reconstruct it properly, sketches from the 1760s and 70s were used to give us the structure we see today. Only 100 barrels of gunpowder stood between freedom and domination by England. This precious little amount of powder, along with other essential military supplies, was stored about 20 miles from Boston at the crossroads town of Concord. To fire a musket required a paper cartridge of gunpowder and musket ball. 100 barrels of gunpowder was enough for about 200 cartridges for each of the 4,000 plus militiamen from around Boston. Not enough for sustained combat, but enough to keep the king's appointed governor from acting in a reckless manner. The military governor, Thomas Gage, knew that if these supplies could be seized, the threat of colonial resistance would be eliminated. Not as well known to him was that Concord was also the rally point of the local county regiments of militia and Minutemen, who were being trained to defend those supplies. On the evening of the 18th of April, 1775, General Gage ordered about 700 select troops to capture the supplies at Concord. This march would be the third time that Gage attempted to seize supplies to disarm the colonists and was his first foray out to Concord. The alarm that the regulars were out of Boston and on their way to Concord was received in Concord about 2 a.m. on the 19th of April by Dr. Samuel Prescott, who had just come from Lexington. Within two hours, 
two Minuteman and two militia companies from Concord, along with a militia company from Lincoln, were assembled on the Concord Commons. In Concord, Colonel Barrett, the militia regimental commander, began receiving reports of the militia being fired upon by the regulars in Lexington. The colonel directed one minute company, led by Captain David Brown, to move down the road toward Lexington about a mile and a half with strict orders not to engage the regulars. Expecting trouble, Barrett sent two additional companies along a high outcropping called Arrowhead Ridge that paralleled the Lexington Road below. The two remaining companies took up positions on the ridge that overlooks Concord. About 8 a.m., the regulars' advance guard came within sight of the militia on the road and the companies on the ridge. The British Light Infantry advanced up the hill and Grenadiers advanced down the road, causing the militia to fall back to Concord. As the British entered Concord, the militia withdrew to the high ground about a quarter mile, close to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. As a British blocking company was being deployed to the South Bridge, Barrett's militia withdrew across the North Bridge to the regimental muster field to await reinforcements from the surrounding towns. The British commander, Colonel Smith, had his troops start searching Concord immediately for the precious supplies they had marched out for, but they found very little. 100 barrels of flour, three iron cannons, a supply of musket balls, and some gun carriages were the only significant materials found. Most of the secret supplies had already been removed earlier that day by the locals or had been very well hidden. The wooden gun carriages were stacked up in the road and set on fire. The cannons were disabled and the flour either broken open or tossed into the mill pond, along with a supply of musket balls. Seven companies were sent to the north end of Concord. Three companies were left at the North Bridge in response to the militia and the other four companies went on to Colonel Barrett's farm to search for rebel supplies. By about 9.30 a.m., 10 militia companies numbering about 450 militiamen had formed at the muster field with more from surrounding towns arriving constantly. Colonel Barrett went to check on the British troops searching his farm and left Major Buttrick in charge of the growing militia. The British commander in charge of the three companies of regulars at the North Bridge was Captain Laurie of the 43rd Regiment. He could plainly see the ranks of the militia who occupied the high ground and were now only 1,200 feet away and growing at an alarming rate. Sensing the apparent growing danger, he brought the two companies he had deployed on the western side of the river back across the bridge and sent an urgent request for reinforcements to Colonel Smith. When the two companies of regulars came back across the bridge, Captain Laurie attempted to organize them in defense of the crossing. But the troops were unfamiliar with him and the commands he gave, and they were having a difficult time following his orders. At the very same time, a large plume of smoke began to rise from Concord where the burning gun carriages and other supplies had caught a public building on fire. An elderly woman who lived next to the building was able to get a number of British soldiers to assist in extinguishing the blaze, which helped to create the smoke that was visible to the militia companies at the muster field. The rising smoke convinced Major Buttrick and his fellow officers that the regulars had put the torch to the town, and the Major ordered the ten companies to prepare to march into Concord. Having watched the two British companies retreat back across the bridge had raised the prospect that it may be possible that the regulars wished to avoid conflict and that he and the colonials would be able to march into the town unopposed. It is known that Major Buttrick was convinced that both sides wanted to avoid war and ordered his men not to fire first. The more than 450 soldiers were formed up into a long column by companies to abreast. The militia column of 10 companies stretched out for nearly an eighth of a mile as they marched down the hill to the bridge. To the 100 tired and disorganized regulars at the bridge, when they saw this column, they saw a very large professional looking body of armed troops advancing toward them with fifes and drums playing. Incorrectly estimating that he was facing up to 1,500 militia, Captain Laurie could clearly see that he was vastly outnumbered. <laughs> 
Lori was informed that reinforcements were coming, but there was still no sign of them. Attempting to slow the advance of the column, the regulars began pulling up planks from the bridge. Shouts from the rapidly approaching column of militia stopped them after only a couple of planks had been removed. Leading the entire column was the Acton Minute Company with Major Buttrick, Lieutenant Colonel Robinson of Westford, and the Acton Company commander, Isaac Davis, at their head. When the militia column was about 80 feet from the bridge, the regulars began a rapid volley. men in the lead companies could see musket balls striking the water. As they were shouting that the regulars were firing ball ammunition, the regulars fired a full volley that wounded the fight for Luther Blanchard and killed Captain Isaac Davis and another Ashton soldier, Abner Hosmer. Major Buttress began shouting for the militia to fire, for God's sake, fire! The command for the militia to fire was shouted throughout the entire column, and the British had half-heartedly expected the militia to break ranks and flee, not realizing that the various companies had a large percentage of veterans from the recent French and Indian War, and that they were no stranger to open warfare. They did not flee. The return fire by the militia wounded half of the British officers, one sergeant and four privates and killed two privates at the bridge. What stunned the regulars further is that the militia kept firing and advancing on them. At this point, the professional British soldiers had had enough, and they panicked and fled, even as their officers tried to hold them in the ranks. The descriptions from British sources described the retreat of the three companies of light infantry as having turned into a stampede for about 300 yards where they finally ran into the reinforcements of two companies coming from Concord, led by Colonel Smith himself. With the leadership of Colonel Smith and the additional fresh troops, the light infantry companies were able to stop their retreat and reform. Meanwhile, the colonial troops could see the British reforming and halted their advance into town. The militia was quite disorganized after the fight as well. Some troops were milling about among their own dead and wounded on the western side of the bridge. With Major Buttrick desperately attempting to organize a defense against a counterattack on the eastern side. When Smith returned with the five companies to his headquarters, he knew he still had four companies left on the other side of the North Bridge. Realizing that he may have to mount a rescue operation, he recalled the troops at the South Bridge and stopped all searching of the town. While the troops were being reorganized, Smith and Major Pitcairn had climbed the ridge above the town and could see nothing but trouble. Militiamen were crossing the South Bridge heading for Lexington. More troops were gathering at the muster field. Major Buttrick's troops were forming up on what are now known as Ripley's Hill and Revolutionary Ridge. He estimated there were about two regiments of militia around him, and worst of all, there was no sign of the reinforcements he had requested eight hours ago. Then the four companies who had been searching at Colonel Barrett's farm were spotted returning by way of the North Bridge. As the light infantry approached the bridge, the commander of the troops, Captain Parsons, noticed that Captain Laurie's infantry had vanished and there were colonial militia on both sides of the river with wounded and dead being carried from the field. As they picked up the pace, no one molested or challenged them. Crossing the bridge, they saw one of the wounded privates laying there with his head split open with a hatchet wound. This event blossomed into a story of militia members scalping prisoners and further increased the anxiety and bitterness of the British infantry. The four companies being allowed to return and rejoin their command demonstrated how the colonists were not yet committed to civil war. Otherwise, the outcome could have been much different. With the return of the four companies, the wounded were being taken care of. One soldier had died and was buried, and the more severely wounded were being left behind. A, a couple of two-person wagons were requisitioned for the wounded officers, as other hastily made preparations were made for their return march back to Boston. Colonel Smith was now very aware 
that there were a lot of militia out on this return road and he would be facing a continuous fight. About 12 noon, the British deployed their light infantry as flankers and began the trip back to Boston. Early in 1775, General Gage had gathered substantial intelligence that detailed the supplies stored in the countryside surrounding Boston. He determined that it was essential to mount a military expedition to search for and destroy those materials. The target that was considered the most vulnerable and valuable was Concord, Massachusetts. Gage had presumed correctly that seizing the sizable amount of supplies stored in and around Concord would be crucial in crippling the militia's effectiveness in opposing his enforcement of the laws dictated by England. With the experience of recent operations and the growing colonial opposition, any expedition leaving Boston with a search and destroy mandate would require substantial manpower to carry it out. Orders were received from England on the 15th of April, and the fateful armed excursion of British regulars was ordered to begin on the evening of the 18th of April. The mission was plagued with troubles from the outset, and the problems only grew the closer they marched towards Concord. The greatest problem they faced, and were helpless to change, was that the element of surprise was lost. This was clearly evident as the countryside was alerted by the ringing of church bells, alarm bonfires, and sporadic gunfire. Another difficulty were the errors of inexperienced junior officers that culminated in the unplanned and unnecessary skirmish in Lexington. In spite of the setbacks encountered in Lexington, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith and his brigade expedition of over 700 continued the six miles further to Concord in search of contraband and figuratively marched into the frying pan. The flat of the pan was the town proper of Concord, which was wide open and level. The rim of the pan was the high ridges to the north and east, the flooded rivers to the west, and the marshes and forests to the south. No rational man, wild-eyed playwright, or movie producer would have ever contrived such a scene the circumstances would have been too improbable. First, Concord was the halfway point of a 34-mile mission, and the soldiers in the ranks were nearly physically spent after spending seven hours marching some 17 miles in the darkness. Second, the regulars carried a limited amount of ammunition with no means of being resupplied. Third, the soldiers had discarded their issued food rations as soon as they began their march. Fourth, due to the nature of the mission, many of the officers were assigned to companies they did not typically lead. This unfamiliarity resulted in low unit cohesion and confusion. For the British regulars, the situation in Concord had become a well-greased pan and they had become the main course. This situation required a simple spark to ignite. The spark that arose came from the most unlikely source, the British troops themselves. When the regulars set fire to the militia's confiscated materials in the town center, it not only began a building fire, but our revolution as well. It was standard practice to destroy the materials by burning the gun carriages and other contraband. But the resulting fire caught a public building on fire. Even though the soldiers fought the fire and managed to put it out, the resulting smoke turned out to be the most important in a series of events in Concord of the 19th of April. To the gathered armed militia, the rising smoke from Concord signaled that the soldiers' orders had changed and it appeared the Redcoats were determined 
to destroy not only the supplies, but to destroy their very homes and livelihoods as well. The scene was set for a confrontation. The town had two large, well-armed groups facing each other, set on a razor's edge with no means or desire to defuse the situation. Now, with none of the senior officers able to manage a way out of this growing crisis, the inevitable fog of war took over the battlefield. It was the type of battlefield fog in which anything and everything could happen. It was in this fog that two unlikely things occurred that changed how the fight in Concord and how the war turned out. The first unlikely event happened when the fully armed assembled militia companies began marching toward Concord. From the militia's viewpoint, passing their ten companies through the British troops at the North Bridge may have seemed like a reasonable thing to do, especially when they saw the evidence that their town was burning. However, to the three British Army companies of regulars guarding the North Bridge, their focus was not on the billowing smoke back in town. Their obvious attention was the enormous armed body of men marching towards them. With every step that the long line of militia took towards the bridge, the awareness of the regulars grew as they could plainly see how vastly outnumbered they were. At the moment the militia column came within 150 feet, the fog closed in and the fight at the North Bridge and the war began. After the clash at the bridge, the second unlikely episode occurred. That event was when disorder gripped the militia after the fight at the bridge. In a perfect world, in the militia's first military action, the colonial soldiers would have stayed in ranks and maintained their discipline. At that very moment, the militia had the capability of taking prisoner the four companies returning from searching Colonel Barrett's farm. The capture of those four companies of regulars with some 132 men would have reduced the British force by a crippling 18%. At that very moment, there existed for a brief period of time the possibility of capturing the entire expedition. The capture of which would have made the continued occupation of Boston nearly impossible. But that moment passed when the troops passed through the battlefield at the bridge without even a word spoken in challenge. With the return of the four companies to Concord, it was well past the time to leave the frying pan. When the British expedition left Concord to return to Boston, they marched straight into history. The commander-in-chief of all British troops in North America, General Thomas Gage, was well aware of the danger of sending any expeditions out into the Massachusetts countryside. He had served with the colonial soldiers in the previous war fighting the French and had a healthy respect for the colonial troops' capacity as fighters. He understood that the defeat of the French on the North American frontier was due in large part to the supply of colonial soldiers that filled the ranks of the British Army. This is important to know because it helps to dispel the widely held myth concerning the colonial militia's form of fighting. The error is that the militia's technique of fighting from cover was completely unknown to the British regulars. After their return to Boston, there were copious complaints in letters and reports from the British officers about the militia's non-typical style of fighting. The complaints stemmed from the fact that the British troops were taking visibly lopsided casualties compared to the militia, and that their infantry training had not prepared them with better tactics to counter them with. The truth is that the British commanding general, General Gage, was very well acquainted with this form of warfare. So much so, that based on his experience with fighting on the American frontier, it was his recommendation that England form its first light infantry regiment in 1758. Subsequently, Gage was promoted to colonel and given the command of that regiment. Leaving Concord, Smith had extricated his force from a deteriorating military situation and marched into an even more precarious one. 
Colonel Smith's advantages of speed, secrecy, and overwhelming force was evaporating as the day grew longer. The wounded slowed progress of the brigade and his light infantry were becoming exhausted. As the ammunition of the brigade and able-bodied soldiers were being depleted, the strength of the militia was growing. The colonial strength was growing because the alarm system rallied more than 4,000 militia on the first day. As the alarm spread further into the countryside by the next day, the colonials had assembled over 19,000 militia, with more arriving daily. Whether Gage wished for it or not, the war he had sought to avoid had begun. At the end of the 19th of April, 1775, the American militia stood victoriously to their duty in defense of hearth and home and proved true and often heard quote. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. What was the change that this small group effected? It was the start of the revolution and the birth of our freedom at the Old North Bridge, the bridge to freedom.